and you both should feel free to gang up on me. So, but, you know, well, it's, it's we don't know. You, you know I don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> hi everybody, uh, and welcome to our last Cavalier conversation on science communication of the year. But we'll have more in the spring, so stay tuned uh, for that. You can keep up uh, by going to journalism.nyu.edu forward slash KC for Cavalier Conversation. Uh, my name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU, uh, where I run the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how to do more and better science communication, especially science journalism. And uh, food, nutrition, is an increasingly important part of that field. So we're really uh, excited, I personally am really excited, to have uh, Marian Nessel and Paul Greenberg here, two people whose work I have admired and I frankly uh, resent their continued <laughs> productivity in, in the midst of, uh, in the face of all their success. Uh, uh, I'm jealous of that, uh, but uh, very happy to have them here. Uh, and as always, grateful to Robert Lee Holtz of the Wall Street Journal, distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute, and the host of the Cavalry Conversations. So take it away, Lee. Thank you, Professor Fagan. So welcome to the Cavalry Conversations on Science Communication. Um, as uh, Dan said, this, this caps our uh, fall series, and uh, it, it couldn't be better. The idea here, for those of uh, you who haven't uh, joined us before, is uh, we want to better understand how uh, information, how uh, new research on important technical topics actually gets to the general public. And to do that, we uh, arrange to bring together a uh, distinguished scientist who has a knack, a gift for also reaching out to the general public um, uh, to talk about their research, and an equally distinguished uh, journalist uh, writer who also does the same thing in the same field. And between the two of them, we hope to explore the pros and cons, ups and downs, mistakes and tips for how to do this more effectively. Now, again, for those of you uh, who are here, we encourage you to ask us questions and join the conversation. This is, after all, not a lecture. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, please uh, also participate by tweeting your questions uh, using the hashtag Cavley convo, and we'll see that uh, we get those uh, teed up and answered. So, you know, food. Here we are. We're here to talk about covering the disputed science of food. I mean, pick a diet, and you pick a fight in the culinary cage match of nutrition writing. Low carbohydrate versus low fat. High protein versus vegetarian. Gluten-free versus paleolithic low sodium versus low sugar. DASH diet takes on me, uh, Mediterranean diet, uh, and a uh, flexitarian diet goes three rounds with the Mayo Clinic diet. And in an unusual tag team, you can pair up the volumetrics diet, the fertility <laughs> diet, and they can take on the Ornish diet. No, really, is salt good, bad? How much sugar is too much? Why are we so obese? me anyway. Will coffee really ward off Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, prevent type 2 diabetes? Does pomegranate juice actually stop prostate cancer? Does it make for better sperm? Perk up the placenta? I mean, is ketchup a vegetable? <laughs> Look, there are so many health and nutrition claims, so little time. And here tonight in our Cavalry conversation on nutrition science, uh, it offers so much food for thought. We're joined by two of America's most influential nutrition writers. On my immediate left, pioneering nutrition scientist, Marion Nessel. Paulette Goddard, professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health emerita here at New York University. And uh, in the department that she chaired from 1988 
to 2003. She's also a visiting professor of nutritional science at Cornell. And her research and writing on scientific and socioeconomic influences on food choice, obesity, and food safety have really set the generation for a, set the agenda for a generation of nutrition researchers. And as a consumer activist, she's paid special attention to highlighting the role of food marketing. Is she prolific? Her collected papers take up 69.5 linear feet <laughs> in 115 boxes up the street here at the Bob's, NYU Bob's <laughs> Library. Uh, but for our purpose, she is also the author of 10 popular books. Her most recent is Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat. It's just come out. And surely, uh, this ought to be required reading for any journalist who dares to pick up a press release about a new food study. And at my far left, Paul Greenberg, in the hat. <laughs> Always. Always. <laughs> you don't want to see what's underneath. <laughs> a, if I may say, lyrical and authoritative writer who covers the ocean and environmental issues uh, with particular attention to the confluence of marine environmentalism and seafood. He's a best-selling author of Four Fish, American Catch, and his newest, The Omega Principle, Seafood in the Quest for a Long Life and a Healthier Planet. He's been a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation, a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow, a W.K. Kellogg Foundation a Food and Society Policy Fellow, and the writer in residence at the Selena Center. He's a regular contributor to the New York Times who lectures widely on seafood and ocean sustainability. Uh, in fact, his TED Talk on fish and sustainability uh, has been viewed uh, more than 1.5 million times. Now, other than their interest in <laughs> nutrition, Paul and Marion have something else in common, which is the fact that they both have been honored with awards from the James Beard Foundation, which is, of course, the leading uh, uh, purveyor of fine food and uh, uh, issues revolving around cuisine and sustainable uh, food. So I want to set the tone here because uh, we are talking about kind of health claim, <laughs> health debunker, and I don't know. I just wanted to make this a little more tangible. <laughs> so I'm just going to... Well, I would throw them, you know, to the, uh, to the audience, but that might be taken in the wrong spirit. But I think I'd just sort of like to lay out kind of an example of what we're discussing here. These are all omega-3 supplements. And uh, they're, uh, I'm told from reading the label, and I always believe what I read on a yeah, nutrition absolutely. label, <laughs> that these come from sustainably harvested fish, uh, in particular anchovies, sardines, and mackerel or a combination thereof. <laughs> a sustainable combination thereof. A sustainable combination thereof. So I want to start, though, a little bit more broadly. It is my perception, and perhaps incorrectly so, that there is something about food writing, there is something about the subject of nutrition that makes coverage adversarial. I mean, it, we, we talked about this beforehand as being a kind of about, about a kind of food fight. But there's some truth to that. Marion, what is it? Everybody hates. Everybody's an expert. Everybody's heart beats, <laughs> but they don't think they're like got standing to take on cardiovascular issues. But they're putting food in their bodies. You put food in your body, you feel good, you feel bad, you feel whatever. You're an expert. Um, so people think they know what it is that the food is doing for them. They think they can tell whether something has vitamins in it. Um, and they don't, not very interested in expertise. It was way ahead of itself. This is something very weird here. Um, uh, Are we good with sound? And I don't know quite what to do about it. I'll talk this way. Yeah, Are uh, you, uh, as long as you're, please, go ahead. I think you're fine. Yeah, so I think everybody thinks they're, everybody thinks they're an expert. And um, there are lots of people with or without training in real nutrition who think they're experts because they've discovered something that makes them feel better. And uh, therefore, if it makes them feel better, it must make everybody else feel better. And they're an expert. 
um, whether they're trained or not. So it's really difficult mm -hmm. for anybody who is not an expert and really doesn't understand nutrition. And let me tell you, it's much harder to understand than you think it is. Um, th they don't know who to believe. And the question that I get asked all the time is, who should I believe? To which my answer is, of course, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say that you know Marion's standing in the journalism community is particularly special because she has, over the years, been a source for just about everyone. Uh, which, me. <laughs> I was just going to we'll say, talk in, about that. including Paul, including Paul. But let me ask the same question of you, Paul, because you see this from a different side. What is it that that makes people sort of? Uh, who are covering this. I mean, stake out a claim and then take on all comers. I mean, there are people who we know who've like made a career out of like journalists. attacking salt. Yeah, J journalists, journalists now. Journalists who made who, a who, career. Who, who, you know, uh, taking on the salt thing or their thing is sugar or yep. I don't know, seafood. Um, well, what? I mean, certainly I agree with Marion. We all feel qualified to be an expert in any one relationship to food that we might have. Uh, but I think it's also almost kind of like adaptive radiation. Like journalists are always looking for a niche. They're always looking for some product or some ingredient or some aspect of the food system that they can attach themselves to. And even though, you know, I speak for myself, I don't always want to write for fish about fish for the rest of my life. Uh, I am forever ensconced as the fish guy. And so, you know, it, attention breeds attention. And so you continue and continue to mine the same vein again and again and again. I think the other thing I think that's um, useful in answering your question is something I remember Michael Pollan said in, um, yeah. uh, in Defense of Food, where he said that you know, in any discussion of nutrition, there's always going to be a good thing and the bad thing. You know, there's going to be salt, and there's going to be sugar, there's going to be fiber, and there's going to be starch. In my case, there's omega-3, and then, oh no, omega-6. So anytime we get into these kind of like Coke versus Pepsi, oftentimes meaningless fights, um, it allows people to choose sides. And I think that Americans, because of our frankly very unsubtle, un-European nature, tend towards the binary, we get sucked <laughs> into these things again and uh -huh. again and again. So, so this is just human nature we're talking about, or? Well, can I, can I make some? I wish you would. Some statement about what a healthy diet is. A healthy diet is so easy to explain that Michael Pollan can do it in seven <laughs> words. <laughs> Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really, that's all there is to it. Everything else is nutritionism, which is the word that's given to using one nutrient as um, sort of the reductive explanation for everything. It doesn't work that way. People eat diets of enormous complexity, many, many different foods, foods that vary from day to day and certainly vary from person to person. To try to make sense of what's healthy and all of that is a really intellectually challenging problem. I think one that has not been solved. I think the hardest, most intellectually challenging problem in nutrition science is finding out what people eat. It's really tough. Because people don't like to say what they eat, necessarily. Well, they, they don't remember. Or they don't Let's remember. Let's be polite. They don't <laughs> remember. Uh, I certainly don't remember. Um, and that makes the science extremely challenging. And so the science is done through what are called observational studies, um, where you compare what people eat to what kind of diseases they get. Those are very, very flawed scientifically, and it's really difficult. You can't lock people up in cages for 40 years and feed them defined diets. I mean, is, as, as a scientist, is, have you tried? <laughs> I, I can't get anybody to fund it. <laughs> Surely the industry would fund it. Oh, no, they wouldn't. No, I know. Oh, so, they so would not. So one of the things I'm, I'm no, leading up to here. No, they fund things that they're going to give them results they want. Well, exactly. So I, I want to bring you around to the topic here that um, if there is this environment, in mental environment, where we're all experts, which means, of course, we're all ignorant. Does that make us particularly susceptible as journalists, as writers, to the, to the uh, uh, scientific marketing of the food industry? Well, I just think it's more complicated than that, that it's the way we're hardwired. That there's, something, there's something about the way that you, I really, this isn't working. There's something about the way that humans think that 
makes people really susceptible to being told that something's nutritious. I don't know. There's some hardwired thing in there. So you go down a supermarket um, aisle and you see, oh, it's got vitamins. It must be good for me. Um, and journalists are susceptible too. Journalists are human. Um, and I don't think that, because the science is complicated, it's difficult for journalists to uh, figure out how to assess studies. Mm -hmm. When I teach journalism students, which I do at Berkeley, um, not here, but I do at Berkeley, you know, the first thing I say is you, you've got to read the original papers. Even if you don't think you're going to understand them, you're going to understand enough about it to be able to ask better questions of the authors. Um, and it's just so easy to look at blueberries will cure erectile dysfunction. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> or I just saw one about nuts and sperm motility. Men who eat nuts have, have, have stronger swimming sperm. Omega threes too also oh, have strong. I've seen the stats. Yes. Had, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, guess who funded the nut study? You know, I mean, guess who funded the, the omega, omega three, three study? study? <laughs> the same thing. So we're very susceptible to that. Uh, and I, I, the only thing I can uh, think about it is that it's built into human psychology, where a lot of stuff happens at an unconscious, uncritical le level that we're just not aware of, and that if you're trained in science, you're trained to compensate for or at least assume that you've got unconscious biases that you have to control for. I think the other thing that happens is that a particular compound or ingredient or fruit or vegetable um, starts, you know, humans are essentially tribal in nature. And we, there is a certain amount of following a tribe down, a, you know, a wormhole to its ultimate end. And like look at, for example, again, omega-3s, because that's what's most on my mind at the moment. But you know, there are nearly 30,000 omega-3 studies. Um, <laughs> why are there 30,000 omega-3 studies? And Because it's not simple. Well, it's not, well, A, because it's not simple. But it's also because once I think that there is within the academic community a certain amount of what I would call research momentum, uh, people realize there's funding in omega-3 studies. And so another one happens, and another one happens, and another one happens. Meanwhile, you know, the journalist sitting on the sideline from their editor is given the directive, find something new. Find something interesting that comes up. And so there's this weird interplay where on the one hand, you have the research that's going on and on and on on the same subjects and the same ingredients again and again and again. And the journalist is, is sort of hovering over their shoulder waiting for something new. And so as soon as something new comes out, even if it's not particularly strong in its findings, you know, 20 sperm were more vigorous. You know, suddenly you could pull that out of the basket of a meta-analysis and say, and you know, with certain subsets of this study, some sperm were more robust than others. And all of a sudden, a journalist is ready to, to grab it. Whether or not it makes sense in the large landscape of what is really truth. And Marion, from your standpoint, there is nutrition science, as you've tried to sort of promulgate to the public. But this sort of thing um, also becomes part of industry marketing, does it not? Oh, without any question. I mean, I started running across, I mean, I think it might have wrote my first article about this in 2001, about food industry funding of research um, that w where you could predict the funder from the title. And I run across studies all the time. Um, I think my current favorite example is mangoes are better than fiber supplements for constipation. Um, That's true, by the way. I'm just of kidding. Course, <laughs> of course it's true. Of course it's true. All fruits are, you know, are good for constipation. And guess who funded it? So I, my first question was, why would anybody do a study like this? Everybody knows that fruits have fiber. Um, and the reason that they do it is because the National Mango Board thinks, OK, they, do the, they fund this study and they can use the results in marketing. So then you ask the question, well, who would do a study like this? Well, a researcher who doesn't believe that food industry funding has any effect on the design or outcome of their study, despite the fact that there is just libraries full of studies showing that we're, I mean, again, this is we're human. 
And humans are very susceptible to the influence of gifts, but that influence occurs at an unconscious level that we don't recognize. So when, when I was trained, in, on, and my training was in molecular biology, we got beaten into us that our biases needed to be controlled for. And even if we didn't know what our biases was, the whole game among the graduate students was to say, nya, nya, you didn't think of that. <laughs> um, and we just had that beaten into us, that we had to control for all those things. But I think not everybody has had that kind of training. Well, it's also, you know, when you, it's, it's, it's useful to take a step back and look at the deep history from whence these kinds of studies emerged. And once upon a time, you know, there really was very poor randomization, very poor kind of, as you say, testing of biases. It was a lot of superstition. You know, m those in the audience old enough to remember Saturday Night Live used to have the skit Theodoric of York, medieval physician. You know, and of course, all of his ideas and theories were totally, you know, poppycock. But, you know, there was this process that started in direct response to real world problems. Like generally one of the first randomized control trials ever happened, happened aboard ship, where mm, yeah. they realized that people were dying of scurvy at huge rates and they wanted to figure out what was actually curing scurvy and what was causing it and so forth. So a physician aboard the ship in the 18th century, you know, actually randomized they had two pairs of, you know, I think eight pairs of people, gave some people some vinegar paste, some other people something else, um, and then a couple of people he gave lemons and limes to, and they didn't develop scurvy. So there, you know, he was, there was no lemon or lime industry pressuring him to choose the lemon or lime as the ultimate choice. It was actually objective science. And from that, you know, original randomization sprung all of this de -super superstitionization of science to the point where you know we were able to come up with penicillin, we were able to come up with antibiotics, all of these things which built upon that initial very precious, very objective search for truth. And the problem is now is that we still have this process in place for randomizing and so forth, but then now we've kind of gotten to the point where we're measuring things that we don't necessarily need to be measuring, like mangoes versus what was it being compared to? I don't know. With, with versus fiber suppling. Mm -hmm. Do we really, like as a society, should we, you know, like everyone's always saying there's not enough money and they're cutting back this and that. Like, meanwhile, we're testing fiber substitutes versus sub supplements versus mangoes. I mean, is that really where I don't science think should so. be focused? I <laughs> well, don't think so. Who's the we here? Oh, yeah, right. Well, but from the, the mango board wants you to eat mangoes instead of apples or oranges or whatever other fruit. I mean, this is strictly about market share, so, which is a very serious problem. We have too much food in this country, and so the f food companies are in trouble, and they need to sell more. They're businesses. They're not social service agencies, right. I'm fond of saying. Um, but I want to talk about what Paul did in this book. Because yeah, I, I want to I just sort of zero in on this for a second, yes. just as an example. Yeah. So let's go dial back the conversation a minute ago. You said there were 30,000 like studies. I believe it. Uh, yeah. yeah, I believe it too. Um, uh, so, you know, 30,000 studies. I get the, the one study from the Walnut Board or, or whatever, whoever it was, um, the, the Blueberry Growers Association. Yeah. Um, and there is, believe there is a fish oil. I mean, it's the global organization for EPA and DHA omega-3 fatty acids, whose conference I did attend um, at the Ritz-Carlton in the Canary Islands several years ago. All expenses, <laughs> all, all, all expenses paid? Of course. Um, not mine, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so so 30,000 studies don't tell us the, the truth or the falsity? of the claim that I hold between I my thumb and finger? I can't wait to hear his answer finger. to this. I mean, <laughs> well, it depends. No, no I'm, a I mean, I'm a journalist. I don't want to write a 390 page nor, book. Nor should you, please. I wanna, it already exists. Why I've would got, you bother? Exactly. So I've got 400, <laughs> I have 400 words. It's coming up on Christmas yeah. and I, I need some filler. So I want to write a nice, happy holiday story about the benefits of this will change my life, make me feel better. There are 30,000 studies that say so, how could I possibly go wrong as a journalist? You know, <laughs> the, I, I can only cite the most recent one. So um, there was the largest- The most recent reason for going wrong or the most- The most recent study. The, the, the largest randomized control trial ever done yeah. just presented its results 
um, in, I think, November 10th at the American Heart Association. And the results were equivocal. So We need another study. <laughs> we need another study, exactly. Um, but what I, want, I want to talk about what Paul did in this book. Right, because, no. I, because I thought it was amazing. Oh, Paul. thanks for <laughs> up on him. Let's yeah. up on him. <laughs> Paul started out, and yeah. Paul came and yeah. told me, I don't remember when yeah. it was, it was quite a long time ago, that he <laughs> Too was going that he was, that he was to do a book about omega-3, and my heart just sank. Yeah. I, I thought, oh, no, I mean, Paul. you've trusted this man over the years. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I thought, oh, no, Paul, no not another book about omega-3s <laughs> and how they're going to save the world. And the story, and what you did in this is amazing. Oh, you, you started out as a believer and you ended up as a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> no, and it's a fantastic story. Thank you. And Thank you. fabulously written, Thank if you. I may say oh, so. You if please, I may please gush. Please do. <laughs> if I may gush. Well, please do. So happy, to be, so happy to be with you here. Um, but I mean, well, what I mean. Yeah. So tell us about that journey. Was that a narrative um, conceit? I mean, did you really go into this uh, uh, convinced of the magic of the little golden uh, capsule? Well, you and know, then your eyes uh, were opened, and <laughs> and you were blind, and now you can see. Or, or what happened? Not exactly. I mean, I have to say, when I left Marion's office, you know, after having that conversation, I was like, oh no, what have I done? Um, but. In all honesty, so I'd written these two other books about fish and seafood. Indeed. And you know, I really come at this more from an environmental point of view. And that's my primary concern is like, how can we live on this planet and not destroy it and continue to eat what we like to eat? Um, but uh, what I noticed is that every time I did a reading, uh, whether mm -hmm. it was you know, about tuna or salmon or whatever, there was always somebody who came up to me after the reading and saying, now, how can I get the most omega threes <laughs> from what, uh, my joints? And uh, you know, it's all these things. Okay, and and I would just sort of brush them off. But then, lo and behold, I turned forty seven, and then my joints, and my blood pressure, and my forgetting things, all these kinds of things. And I found that whenever I Googled any of my conditions, because first of all, my father's psychiatrist. Uh, I stay pathologically away from medication, so I was looking for homeopathic things, and whenever I put, you know, some of my middle-aged crises into the Google, omega-3s came up. And then, if you turn it around, if you put into the computer, um, omega-3s may, you get <laughs> such a bizarre panoply oh, of oh, things, oh, like, oh. you know, may increase muscle mass in older adults, right. may increase brain volume. My favorite one, you, you, you took my line, may improve sperm competitiveness, yes. which, which, and I was like, you know, and I would just reel in, during talks. Why runs. can't they learn to cooperate? I, I, I no. know. <laughs> but it was funny because I, you know, whatever, you get into your spiel, and I yeah. was on book tour, yeah. and I was like, you know, yeah. may do this, may increase sperm competitiveness. And somebody raised their hand in the audience in Miami and said, why would I want my sperm to be more competitive? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, well, I mean, I certainly want my, I want it to be the most competitive. I don't want it to be outcompeted. But anyway, all that's by way of saying, um, I ended up going down the rabbit hole, trying to understand where these, um, the initial idea mm -hmm. came from. Also think, you know, what was interesting, it's also really an environmental story. Because it turns out that in omega-3s, mm. um, you know, we think of them as this fish pill that we invented, but they were actually invented by nature, and they were invented hundreds of millions of years ago. And they actually- In green plants. In, 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 in green, well, in, in microalgae, actually. And they were invented, actually, as a defense against climate change. But not the climate change we're experiencing now, the other climate change, where after the, what's called the great oxidation event, yeah. all of the phytoplankton pulled the oxygen out of the, or the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, things got cool, and suddenly you needed membranes that were more supple and more able to metabolize at lower, rate, at lower temperatures. Poof, that's what the omega-3 does. So I thought, in a way, in, in, the, in the end, the book is a parallel journey. It's a journey to understand the environmental question around omega-3s. But then what ultimately, you know, if you want, it's the bait on the hook, right? Because we all are ultimately self-obsessed. And so if that could lead us to a larger understanding way the environment works, so be it. So that's, sorry, long, long answer to a short so question. So you baited the hook with our self-interest. Yep. Um, but you knew all along that what you really wanted to write about was the reduction industry, I yes. think is the right word for it. Yep. Um, I just came back from a ship that was, the uh, captain of which was very proud that they could 
uh, render down 950 tons of this stuff. Were you um, in the Chesapeake? Where were you? No, I was in the Bering Sea. Ah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a powerful financial uh, uh, community. Yes, I mean, one pound of every four pounds caught today gets reduced into fish meal or fish oil and fed to animals. And then right. the thin film floating over the top is the omega-3 supplement. So it's a multi-billion dollar business. But imagine if like what would, you know, it's interesting when you held up the, 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 the mm -hmm. bottle and you said all taken from sustainable sources. And I tell you, I went to Antarctica and I looked at the krill industry. Yeah. And I went yeah. to Peru and looked at the anchovy industry. And I went to, you know, to, to the Mediterranean and looked at the sardine and anchovy industry there. Every single one of those industries is entirely sustainable, totally sustainable. But when you add it up, it's 24 million metric tons taken out of the ocean every year, one out of every, so the question you ask yourself, well, what w that's by the way, the human weight of the United States taken out of the sea every year. What would the ocean look like if you had more 24 million metric tons more in the ocean to feed whales, penguins, and everything else that we like to enjoy and eat? Not penguins and whales, obviously, but. But so yeah, so that was really a big okay, question right. of it, a, well, a big part of it. So back to the 30,000 studies, Marianne, I want to ask you. So what does a reporter, how should a science writer, how should a uh, food writer avoid getting taken in by research claims that come gift wrapped in scientific studies, but I'm not picking on omega-3, but this bill just happens to be here. Yeah. Um, but is, is, you know, snake oil is, is just a marketing claim. What's, what's a journalist to do? Read besides, the papers. Besides call you. Read the papers. Well, but the papers all look great, uh, like on the surface. Mm. It's like, oh, I, I had a control group of, you know, 16 people that I locked in a cage for 40 years and fed on there. <laughs> or in the case of your Lyme thing, there isn't an institutional uh, uh, review board in the world that would allow that experiment. Right like, today. Yes, we, we fed. <laughs> these guys died of scurvy. <laughs> right. yeah. No problem. Yeah, they died, and, and this seems to work for these two. So, right. but, but seriously, how, how do we evaluate a study? Because well, they all I'm, look good. They all come with the trappings yeah, I mean, of I formal think, research. I, I think there are some guidelines, and these go for everybody as well as reporters. If it's a breakthrough, you should be really suspicious. If it's a miracle, we don't have miracles in nutrition. If it's an absolute, be very suspicious. L sugar is poison, that's an absolute. Be very suspicious of that. Um, if it's one item, of, like an omega-3 or a food that cures multiple uh, conditions, that's, a, that's ground for suspicion. Um, and then oh, my well, favorite is long. everything you always knew about nutrition was is wrong. That's <laughs> my favorite, absolute. That one sends red flags high in the air. So a certain amount of skepticism. I mean, there are all kinds of um, guides on the web about how you evaluate um, scientific studies without knowing anything about science. Those give very good advice. And if a science writer is writing about these, for you don't use the press release. You don't take the press release and repeat it and print it. And that happens all the time. You know, I, I don't want to pick on them, but it's part of my prep for this talk. I, there is a, a, a Food Writers Association. And I went and looked at their ethics statement. Oh. So I was just curious. And, and I could probably do this to any, what does I, wa I want to say, say any, food, any, not too much. Plants. Plants. Well, <laughs> we should be so lucky. I, I want to I wanna not beat up on them too hard. I could probably do this to any group of technical mm. people who but band together. Okay. But the ethics statement was things like, don't put your byline on the press release. Um, don't plagiarize. Don't, there wasn't a word in there about. Uh, Think critically think critically or uh, uh, talk to more than one scientist or even the idea that there was an underlying science here that ought to be taken into account and the norms and the considerations of peer right. review and, and all that and sort of stuff. It was all um, like yeah. travel writers often, like if you're going to take their money, then you can't uh, do this or do right. that. I mean, and I would, all, I would also say, for heaven's sakes, who funded yeah. it? Look at who funded it. Most scientific journals require mm -hmm. authors to say who fund, who paid for their study, and whether they have any other financial ties, consulting agreements, 
um, mm -hmm. you know, they're on the boards of or whatever with the funders of the study or somebody like the funders of the mm -hmm. study. So it's pretty easy to look that up if you look at the original paper. If you don't look at the original paper, you're not going to know that. So I really need to pay a lot of attention to uh, f the financial disclosure conflict of interest. Well, I think it's worth at least a uh -huh. glance because yeah. um, you know, these, I can recognize an industry funded study by its title. Um, I mean, really, more often than not, yeah. I can go through the table yeah. of contents of a science journal and said, I bet that one, that one, and that one. And and well, well, but just for the sake of discussion, I mean, we, we often treat private funding, let's not call it industry funding for a second, let's call it private funding, as if it's radioactive, that it's an expression of advocacy or special interest. And therefore, if it doesn't come from a government agency, it must somehow be contaminated. But suppose I want to study what was the thing you said? Walnuts and sperm motility or mangoes right, and why would you want Who to is going to fund that if not the mango board? Yeah, so but the, the real question is... The real question <laughs> What's wrong is, with that? The real question, because it skews the research agenda. Why would you want to study that? On what grounds would you do something like that when, when you think about walnuts or any other nut in the context of everything that people eat, you know, if you just think about it for a second, it can't possibly make that much difference. It cannot possibly, because you're eating diets of amazing complexity. So the issue with industry funding is that it has an agenda. Um, it's not that, uh, there's a, I get letters all the time from trade associations for the pecan board, the yogurt association, <laughs> the grape association, um, saying we've got $50,000 and we're looking for research proposals for studies that will demonstrate the benefit of our product. That's what the letters say. The, that's not science. Yeah. That's marketing. And they send these to you? Yeah, I get them all the time. And it's um, hard to, un you know, it's also hard to un well, underestimate the, the human desire to be... To, to please. To please, to please and be approved. And let me just say that yeah. there's a big difference between a study that is framed as let's see what we can do to show benefit yeah. and let's see what we can do to find an effect. There's a huge difference. One is basic science, one is marketing. So and true. we had an example of that. The New York Times had a... Um, a series of articles about a study done at the National Institutes of Health this year that was funded by five alcohol companies, mm. uh, five makers of alcoholic beverages. I love alcoholic beverages. I love it that all of you had some before this <laughs> started. Um, and they gave $67 million to the NIH to do a study on alcohol, one drink a day, and the risk of heart disease. When the writer wrote the first story, she got a tip from somebody. Somebody called her and said, you really ought to look into this, and you might want to FOIA some emails. And the writer did, and discovered that essentially the investigators at NIH were in collaboration with the alcohol funders mm -hmm. and had promised them that they would design this study so that it would show that one drink a day reduced the risk of heart disease, and they would not run it long enough to show a risk for breast cancer or any other problem. Um, and when the NIH found out about it, they did a huge investigation and they eventually stopped the study. But it's really easy to design studies to give you the answer you want. It's not hard at all. Mary, can I ask you a question? Have you, in your long and you know, illustrious and very full of integrity career, have you ever come across a study or a finding about a food that genuinely made you say, huh, that's interesting and that's true and that definitely enlightened me in a way I've never been enlightened, and maybe that's true, and maybe we should be eating this or taking this or whatever, in, in all of your years. Doing in the beginning of my career. When I first started out um, teaching nutrition, um, I was trained in molecular biology, and I started, I was teaching in a biology department, I was given a nutrition class to teach. That's how all this started. And so I was a beginning nutrition person, just like anybody else who's learning about nutrition for the first time. I was very excited about individual foods. And I, at one point, I wanted to write a book about all the fun things you could say about broccoli. 
<laughs> one of which was uh, the late George Bush, mm -hmm. who, you know, who had this wonderful statement about broccoli that he didn't like it and he was president and he didn't have to eat it. <laughs> um, that's um, you know, my, my memorial for him. Um, but, the, uh, but then as time went on, um, I stopped, I started thinking, no, that's not how people eat. People don't eat one food. They eat foods of enormous complexity and variety and that we really need to be looking at the larger picture, but it's much harder to study. Um, you know, I think there, were, there are interesting components in food and food scientists do a lot of that. Some of that is, is fascinating and it has scientific interest, but mm -hmm. doesn't have any practical interest. Mm -hmm. And I was always, right from the beginning, interested in what kind of advice could we give people about what to eat? People were desperate for nutrition advice, even when I started out, which was in the mid-1970s, when Francis Moore Lappe had just mm -hmm. come out with Diet for a Small Planet, and I wondered if there was anything to it. I mean, that's really what got me started. And Linus Pauling, Vitamin C and the Common Cold, he, a two Nobel Prize winner, was telling everybody to have 10 grams a day of vitamin C, and your health problems would be solved. You wouldn't get colds, you wouldn't get cancer, you wouldn't get anything else. Um, and that's it. actually Linus Pauling. Show, I went into him a little bit in in in, in the, the book that I just did, and I think that's another interesting thing that can happen in the course of researchers' lives. Where, you know, Linus Pauling. When did he come up with the vitamin C stuff? It was kind of after his big oh, yeah. stuff, you know. So who he was, was aging? He was aging, <laughs> but you know, who, I don't. I won't speak to whether or not he was of sound mind, but certainly he was a big personality who found himself out of the spotlight. And what better way to grab the spotlight than to grab a nutrient and start saying taking, you know, five grams or ten grams? An, ab I an absolute. Yeah. That's an absolute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have an absolute over here. Question, sir. But you have to not look at it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so journalists uh, really hate it when you you tell them that this is not a story, this is not a story, this is not a story, but. I happen to agree with you that uh, most nutrition, most this is a new nutrition study stories are a waste of time. Uh, the thing is, it, it seems to me though that, that the, the big issue with food journalism is that it's obsessed with people even more than most journalism is people centric, but food journalism is just entirely about human beings. And it seems like a way to reinvigorate food journalism is to start to incorporate other other frameworks besides this either it will does this taste good or and is this good for me it seems like there are other really interesting frameworks like for instance an animal welfare framework and a biodiversity oh, framework mm -hmm. or the fact that 30 percent of the arable land surface mm. of the planet is now given over essentially factories producing a limited number of biota, a few dozen mm -hmm. uh, 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 plants and animals. Yeah, but nobody wants to read that. Well, well but, but I wonder if that's really true. And, and what suggestions do you guys have for moving food journalism past this trap of this new study is, will change the way you eat? Uh, Systems thinking. System, so what, 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 what does that mean? Systems yeah, what thinking. does that mean? Thank yeah, well, I mean, everybody's now is talking about food systems, which is the entire picture of food from production to consumption, uh, or from production to waste, which is you know, the entry point into a lot of that these days. Um, and everybody's teaching courses in food systems, and but they're hard to write about because they don't have words that are easy. I'm still not sure what you mean by well, food system. Food system. Are you talking sort of, if system. I was going to translate it into Dan's framework, right? farm to table? I mean, is that... Farm know, to waste. Farm to waste? Farm okay. to waste. Um, so it's everything that has to do with what happens to food from the time it's grown mm -hmm. to the time it's transported, stored, prepared, retailed, consumed, thrown out. That's, that's the food system. 
So that's very hard to think about. It's complicated. And most people don't see anything that happens to a food before it gets to them in a retail situation. Um, and what happens before then is invisible to most people. So how do you make that kind of thing interesting? There are lots of people writing about it. I don't know how many people When you say it's invisible it. to people, you mean they That's they invisible to the public. Yeah, yeah, that they think chicken actually comes wrapped in plastic. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree. And I we just have, wanted to make sure have, I understood. We have evidence that kids think that. Yeah. So, so Paul, when you started to unpack this, which is yeah. in, in a way that I think Dan is alluding to, yeah. I mean, what did you find? Well, I mean, speaking to Dan's question and Dan's point, I think the way to expand this question, and it's sort of what I tried to do with omega-3s, is to get away from this, is this pill good or bad for me? But to try and talk about how can we eat in such a way that's good for us, but also good for the planet? The planet. And, you know. Food systems thinking. Food, food systems thinking. You know, so like, you know, my dad is a doctor and I spent all my life growing up around doctors. And I'm always struck by even the most kind-hearted doctor, how removed they are from the natural world and the health of biosystems when they get down to just talking about your acid reflux or something. You know what I mean? So I think that what we, what I tried to do in the case of the omega-3, for example, I alluded to this earlier, right? So in the human body, there is this competition that goes on between omega-3s that are coming to us mostly from seafood, but also from leafy greens, mm -hmm. um, and omega-6s, right. which come to us largely from commodity oils like soy, from corn oil, and also from feedlot animals. This people who say that exists, the competition is real, some say it doesn't really matter, blah, 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 blah. But what's interesting is that omega-3 food systems and omega-6 food systems are truly in competition. How? Well, look at what it takes to grow corn and soy and feedlot animals. We have to strip away all of the vegetation and replace it with corn going up right up to our riverbanks. We have to flood our rivers with nitrate fertilizer that then causes hypoxic dead zones in our coastal mm -hmm. waterways. Mm -hmm. All of these things that this omega-6 system does to our environment impedes these omega-3 foods that turn out to be, generally speaking, probably better for us. It is better, generally speaking, to eat a lot of leafy greens, to eat you know, um, lo lower calorie seafood rather than higher calorie feedlot beef. It is generally better for us. So whether or not we're gonna go into like which enzyme is working on which omega-3, who cares ultimately? All we care about is that our planet is healthy and that we are healthy. And I think, you know, I just did it with one nutrient or with one molecule mm -hmm. or one set of molecules. But I think if we could get medical schools talking to food studies departments, talking to environmental mm -hmm. studies, I mean, I'm not an academic, I'm not from academia, mm -hmm. and I know that those sorts of conversations are often extremely fraught and everyone's very territorial, but we're territorial at the risk of destroying the world. And if this conversation can't happen on the level of an open-minded university, where the hell can it happen? So, you know, is that journalism? Is that journalism's job? Maybe. Is it journalism? Is journalism's job to stop chasing the little bait on the hook of the miracle compound? Yes, certainly we have to stop that. But it is also up to academic institutions to inform that conversation and to frame it in a more intelligent way. Hmm. I have an intelligent question here. <laughs> uh, so no I'm pressure. speaking on behalf of the bait on the hook journalists, some of us who are writing, you know, two stories a day or at least Thank a story you. a week. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of us in this room, especially the ones who've gone to the SHRP program, we know that we're not supposed to take the bait. We know exactly, you know, point out who funded it. But uh, if we don't cover these with sort of that, it's like you have that sort of complexity, right? Where it's like, well, if I cover it, I'm giving it air. But so how do we actually navigate this landscape and cover it so that we're sort of beating down the folks who are taking the bait every time while not, do you, you kind of get what I'm getting at? That yes. like, how do we decide what to cover and what not to cover and how to cover it? Thank you. Yeah, let's refocus back to our, our theme here. Yeah. What on earth are we supposed to do? Tell the truth. First you state the truth, then you state whatever the bait is, well, and then you state the, fruit, the truth again. Well, but I sort of had the feeling coming into this discussion, Marion, 
that we actually don't really know that much about what the truth of modern nutrition is once you get past Michael Pollan's clever eight words, you know. I mean, there is a... Well, a what's the question that you're asking? A hundred, two hundred billion dollar industry that's... Or that's trillion, puts, trillion, trillion, actually. thank you. I didn't want to um, go overboard, trillion, but trillion. Actually. That's uh, cranking stuff out. That mm -hmm. has got a, a horrible pressure to not attract attention and praise, but to just simply move product. We're in that pipeline, whether we like it or not. We're at the end of it. I mean, it's coming in our face. It's part of the fire hose. It's news. I think you write about the real issues, the really important ones. You write about the food system issues. How do we produce food? How do we use food? How do we consume food in a way that's healthy for us and the planet? Those are the big questions. And always to put anything that you're writing about in that context um, makes a really big difference. There's a great quote which I always put up as the opening slide whenever I teach um, any kind of writing class by Edmund Wilson. And he said, um, I, I'll paraphrase, but you know, you must load solid matter into the ephemera of the day to day, which um, editors and their anxious desire to please the cause of the moment will, um, will always strive to tamp down solid matter and always strive for the ephemera. But you, and as, you know, you if, especially if you're a freelancer, where you get to kind of look out over the landscape of so many different publications, yeah, you can bow to the needs of the day or this particular editor, but keep the long game in focus. One of my favorite parts of doing this particular book was I got to call out what I call the standard article. Like, Every freaking publication, once I was got ensconced as the fish guy, asked me to write this article. The world, the oceans are overfish and our oceans are in trouble, but these five species <laughs> will help you improve your health and the planet's health. So, you know, and I just like, I could either, I could write that. Gee, sounds article. like systems, food systems writing to me. Right, but here's the thing. There's a difference between just regurgitating the same thing over and over again and then actually kind of thinking, huh, at what point am I being fed the nonsense of the seafood industry, and what point is there some actual validity in that? So even though you might have to write, you know, for Eater or for like whatever publication, this little thing, you're going to come across so many crumbs that are sprinkled from the Hansels and Gretels of the world of much more interesting things, and you could at any point in your tr time, return to those things and do deeper, more profound work. So just like know that, you know, listen, I'm a freelance journalist. I don't have a job. I have to make a living. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I don't have, you know, but I have to also know that if I lose my integrity, if I lose my soul along the way, nobody's going to want to hear from me. So you have to, you know, always keep in your back pocket your real self and, and as Marion says, truth and your sense of it. Professor Fagan. So, sorry to hog the mic here. Um, this is not my question. Uh, speaking of uh, regurgitation and, uh, <laughs> the, and the daily churn, uh, uh, this is a question from a daily journalist, uh, Kate Sheridan, who is a hmm. writer for STAT in uh, Boston. Mm -hmm. She says, speaking of focusing on people, when public figures like dare I say it, Gwyneth Paltrow or mm. Jordan Peterson promote nutritional advice, sure. how can it be covered well? Should it be covered at all? And I guess I, I would just add one question to that. What if, and I know this is unlikely, but what if they're right? Well, the, the, the celebrities? Jade eggs? <laughs> <laughs> just ask him. Um, okay. Yeah. So, one, okay. do we cover celebrities who are attention getters? But, dude, the the second question, which is, was buried in that, which is, is, dare we ignore the fringe? No, I heard a question also. How do you know whether they're right or not? Well, I, uh, which is a more complicated one that requires knowing something about what you're writing about, um, and putting it in context. Um, I'm very impressed by Health News Review. Does everybody mm -hmm. know sure. about that? They have all kinds of guides about, did I say something funny? I, I don't know that much about it. Um, 
Yeah. I know it just lost its yeah. funding. Yeah. Um, of course it did. <laughs> but yeah. An indication of just how good it was. It yeah, lost, it lost its funding. <laughs> but yes, um, a, a but very, I'm, ho hoping very, that, uh, I'm hoping that what it has will stay up on the web forever. But um, for, for those who don't, would you give yeah, us a little I mean, thumbnail it, sketch? It's, it's, a, um, um, it's a site with, that gets people to evaluate press releases for health news oh, articles. Really? And the mm -hmm. um, and so they do sort of a scoring system. They get people to score them, and then they write lots of sort of position papers, very short and very useful about how you evaluate studies. Um, and of course, I like it because, with respect to this book that I just did, because one of the questions is who funded it, which I think is an absolutely key question. Um, but there are other questions to ask too, and it goes through those. So that's sort of an easy way to get started on how you interpret. You know, I, and I'd say, if it's a breakthrough, forget it. If it's a miracle, forget it. If it's all of those other things that I went through, those are, are um, you know, sort of key words that send up red flags. You always want to be skeptical about those and at least look at what else has been done. I, I want to ask, just change the subject yeah. slightly here. Um, so, and I'm going to ask you a variation of this too. Marion, you're a scientist, you know, you're not... Trained as one. Lapsed. <laughs> well, but that's what I'm asking you about. So you had a very prolific and very busy research career after you made this curious decision to actually reach out to the public as aggressively as you do and be as uh, cooperative a source for journalists as that you have been and somehow or other managed to find time to write 10 pretty good books. Um, excellent books. Well, Thank I've you. read all of them. I've <laughs> read a couple of them, so. But yes, excellent books. Um, there are a lot of uh, postdocs, a lot of scientists, a lot of young uh, researchers out there who uh, are interested in taking advantage of the sort of technology of storytelling that we can all use now. You don't have to be empowered as a journalist to reach out to the public. and and uh, tell your story, but you know they, they might worry that this takes time, this takes energy, this takes creative juice away from their work as scientists. I mean, how did you pull this off? Well, first of all, I'm a lapsed scientist, and I lapsed pretty early. Um, well, what does that mean? Oh, I was a postdoc, and um, I had two small children, and it was perfectly obvious to me I wasn't going to be able to have a scientific career. I had nobody to take care of my kids. I mean, I have this famous story that I tell about discovering that everybody in my lab was there on Saturday morning. It was just an accident that I happened to go in on a Saturday morning. I was totally shocked. Everybody was there. I thought, oh, this is why everybody's treating me as if I'm not getting any work done. Oh, this is why I'm not getting any work done. There was no way I could do that. So I stopped my research career right after my postdoc and took a teaching job. And then I was lucky enough in what I did over the next umpteen years to land at NYU with tenure. And that made all the I'm difference. I'm sorry, nobody that lands at NYU with tenure <laughs> by just I falling was, off their electric scooter. Well, they brought me into chair a department of home economics. Yeah. I'm not home kidding. Economics. I'm okay. not kidding. I'm not kidding. That's what happened. So it was just an incredible stroke of fortune mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I was hired here with tenure okay. to okay. chair this department. Um, and that was life changing. Um, then I could start doing these things. Hmm. I couldn't do it before. And I would not recommend to anybody who's probationary for tenure that they spend any time at all on public engagement unless they happen to be at a place that values it. Most places, most was, science places <laughs> don't. I was just going to ask is there a an academic, from a scientist standpoint, is there an academic institution that does value This one. This one. At least in the school that I'm in. Three which cheers for NYU. I'm not yeah. sure about arts and sciences, mm -hmm. but in the school yes. that I'm in, they value it. So. so let me flip the question to Paul and ask, so Paul, as you just so boldly stated, you're a freelancer. You don't have a normal job. You um, uh, don't have... I bake a, a lot of bread. Uh, <laughs> bake a lot of bread, um, but surely not enough to be self-supporting. And well, bread, uh, I sell at a fairly high price for bread. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I have seen you up at you know Grand Central Station, you know, cooking oysters yeah, and things. But that's <laughs> um, I am curious how, as a freelancer, now 
you pulled off this particular project that we've been this uh, book. exploring a little bit. Yeah, so uh, you know you had a very great success with Four Fish, so you had the the hundred million dollar advance. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you and your vast staff. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, put this out. Now, how did you pull this off? Well, um, I'd written two books on fish and seafood, and um, you know, um, one always you always have to dangle more bait in front of the editors. And I said um, that I was going to write a third book. It was going to be the third in my marine trilogy. Ah. <laughs> and you know, Game of Thrones speaking was underway, of, and uh, you know, so, and they're like, speaking wow. Speaking of packaging and marketing, and, yeah. and it's, it was very funny. I always think about that line from um, broadcast news. I say it here, it comes out there. You know, and I literally had the head of Penguin Press say to me, "Well, you know, good. You know, I'm glad to hear you're working on the trilogy." I'm like, "What trilogy? Oh, the trilogy, <laughs> right? The trilogy." Um, <laughs> I see. Yeah. But you know, it's like there's something ominous. A third book, third fish book shall be written. There shall not be a fourth. You know, it's like it gets people very excited. So that helped. Um, uh, I also I did get a Pew Fellowship um, from the, the Pew mm -hmm. Charitable Trust has a very great program called the Pew Fellowship in Marine mm -hmm. Conservation. So that covered a certain amount of my costs. But I also, in other books, I've used this sort of what I call kind of a, a stepping stone approach, which is that, you know, the first time you sell a book, you're like oh, great, I got this advance. And then you, you kind of run the numbers, and you're like, there's no freaking way I'm going to be able to write this book. I said I was going to Antarctica. That's 30 grand right there. How am I going to get to Antarctica? So as a freelancer, what you do is you kind of chart a course of short journalistic pieces that you could do that kind of comp make a constellation that kind of connect the dots. So like in the case of, you know, with Four Fish, for example, you know, I sold a piece to New York Times Magazine about catfish farming in Vietnam. You know, there's no way I could have paid for that out of my own pocket. So they sent me there. And what was weird is that, you know, the different pieces at first didn't make sense. They just seemed like random acts of journalism. But again, because you have a little bit of an advance, maybe you get a little bit of grant money, you can pull back from all that journalism and you say, what's the What's the common thread here? Is there a common thread? Usually, weirdly enough, you can kind of find a common thread. I kind of think of the parallels. You ever notice that when you turn the music on on your car and it's raining, that the windshield wipers always find the beat of whatever it is that you're listening to? Kind of works that way a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, I dare you to, to pitch a book mm. randomly and try and make everything in your life connect to it, but. Maybe it's the thing, back to food systems, I do believe in systems, I do believe in the collective unconscious, I do believe that the journeys that you take inform your larger sense of the world and of the universe. And so through those bits of journalism, through a little bit of grants, through the, um, through the, the advance, and then frankly there are credit cards. <laughs> Which, yeah. um, you know, honestly, like if Four Fish had not gone on to the success it had been, I'd just be in giant credit card debt. So How many credit cards do you have? Well, I've been trying to shrink them, you know. <laughs> um, no, at the time, I mean, it was like, you know, just I was just rolling from one to the other. It was, I, it, was, it, was, it was a nightmare, and I just, you know, one of the reasons I actually decided to write the book in the first place is that I was having a son, a child, and I was like, oh, I could use this advance to draw the first part of fatherhood. <laughs> and I was like, what was I thinking when I think back to the whole thing? But... I don't know, fortunately, you know, I'm also very, um, you know, one piece of advice I would give to anyone who's considering a freelance journalism career, and I would just say I wouldn't discourage a freelance journalism career at this point, you know, because I think, like, the career that you had, Lee, mm. is, doesn't exist anymore. Absolutely does not exist. Uh, you, you, you know, the idea of that you could enter in as a cub reporter um, and then work your way up, not going to happen. So you have to be the ultimate you know, yours is the ultimate omnivore's dilemma. You have to figure out mm -hmm. where to move, and, and, and you mm -hmm. can do it, but you have to be very fleet-footed. You have yeah. to be ready to do a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, been very patient sorry, to sorry. ask a question. No, no, I wanted to hear your uh, answer because it was very useful, very interesting. I'm wondering if either of you or both of you have suggestions for reporters for how to get um, people interested in the parts of food systems, food waste, land use, um, that aren't as exciting or interesting, might make people feel squeamish, they might not be drawn to. What are suggestions for how to tell stories that people will engage with instead of turn away and go to kind of the fodder that we've been talking about all night, which is sort of clickbaity? Find the human. Yeah. I don't know. 
That's how you do it. You find somebody whose story. Well, but what if the human's a marketing executive? I mean, it, uh, marketing executives are interesting. <laughs> ah, so what? Perhaps the story is the profile of the of the marketing director who's busy spreading these strange studies. Yeah. I mean, what? The, right. But this is a this is a really key question. I mean, it's nice to talk Absolutely. about food systems and. Well, I'll give you an example. I've got 400 words, and it's 3 o'clock, and I need to have this done by 5.30 because my editor's got, she's got five more things she wants me to do. Can I, can I throw one example out? Yeah, please. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of speak globally about that. You'll know when you see it to some degree. But I remember I was working on a story for the New York Times magazine about Chilean sea bass. <laughs> and I'm a fisherman, and I'm always inter interested in interesting, weird stuff that goes mm -hmm. on with fish biology. So I was there in the Falkland Islands, and I'm talking to this fish biologist, and I said, can you tell me something about the Chilean sea bass? And he blah, blah, blah. it got very boring and technical. And I was like, Just, is there something, any other thing that's really, what makes the Chilean sea bass totally different? And this British, stuffy British guy said, well, of course, they don't have a swim bladder. And I, <laughs> Uh, really? And actually, that's kind of key because a yeah, swim bladder is yeah. the thing that makes, a f it's, if you, any of you have ever scuba dived, it's the thing that makes you float yeah. and keeps you buoyant. I said, really? Well, how do they stay buoyant? He said, oh, well, the process is very complicated. They secrete oils into their tissue. And I, they secrete oil into their tissue? And I think, does it make them very moist? And he said, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> turns out, it does make them very moist. And it turns out that that evolutionary huh. adaptation is what keeps freaking Chilean sea bass from drying out in the hot tray in the cruise ship, which is why the Chilean sea bass became this huge international commodity that pirate ships go to the bottom of the world to harvest so that the freaking thing doesn't dry yeah. out in the hot tray. Yeah. And that was all about a biological specific thing. It didn't have a swim bladder. But that I, was fascinating. I, I, think Isn't she and I, I think she and I, though, are still back on, how do I get to the Falkland Islands? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't, I am anyway. isn't Chilean sea bass the fish formerly known as Prince? A Patagonian toothfish. Yeah, Patagonian toothfish. Desosticus yeah. eligenoides, <laughs> if you yeah. want the real name. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah, no, um, it, it, I don't know. The whole, the larger question is, of course, is why does it matter to me? Why does it mean anything to me? And when I've done these, this Omega-3 talk, um, I often, I put up this fake graph um, you know, because my, my partner is actually a statistician, and I always say we've gone through 80 million studies, and we've produced this graph. And one bar is um, is self-interest, and the other bar down here is planetary interest. You know, and you, if you keep that model in your mind, that it's people are very, very selfish, and whatever can please people's selfishness justifies. If if you can work that in, then you bring in planetary. But just knowing that, you know, just be a little cynical about it, but keep your you know, your, your, your sense of hopefulness in, in the back pocket. Please. Yes, so we've discussed how much bias and industry funding and self-interest um, has tainted all of, or not all of, but a lot of food research. So when we look at the entire canon of nutrition studies, mm -hmm. how much of it is trustworthy and worth something? Trust, trustworthy is the, wrong, is the wrong question. Science is incremental. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, if you're asking how much um, nutrition funding is, indus is funded by industry, I only know one study, and it's an unpublished study, that looked at that question, and they came out with about 15%. So it's a small percentage. Most f nutrition studies are still funded by NIH, um, the National Science Foundation, or foundations of one kind or another, and you can dig and try to find out how biased the foundations are. There's some biases there, but um, those are considered independent sources as opposed to food companies that, whose objective is truly marketing. And the uh, and there you know there's lots of bias in research, um, and there's an, a concerted attack on nutrition research that's happening right now, coming largely from statisticians at Stanford, um, <laughs> who believe that um, nutritional epidemiology has nothing whatsoever to teach us that's useful because the methods are so poor, and they also think that the disclosure of bias in nutrition studies as opposed to all others should include uh, things like 
dietary preferences. You should state what you what kind of a diet you follow in every study that you publish. Wow. Um, really. Well, Really? Isn't that great? Isn't that great? I'm a vegan and I do I'm not a, support this paper. I'm an, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an omnivore. Um, and the, um, you know, so, the, so this is going on because there are people who are so concerned about biases in nutrition research and those biases come from career ad advancement issues and ideologies about nutrition and so forth. But those are different across different studies. So some studies will be done by somebody with one ideology and some studies will be done by another. The results will be different. Industry funded studies almost invariably come out with results that favor the sponsor. Um, but I think you look at whether the result of the study makes common sense or whether it seems like it's too good to be true or whether it's so different from anything else you've ever seen that you just think, how could this be? You should be asking, how could this be? Let me reframe the question a little bit, if you don't mind. Which is, okay, so, so far we've been talking in a, in a nice, very interesting and, and very large, but kind of self-contained uh, food thing. So how do you approach those same issues about truth and who do we trust and industry funding and such? If say instead of just omega three or this this diet this nutritional thing versus another, the topic is say genetically modified foods, where as you know there's an enormous like set of camps now, um, and the suggestion that you even went to an industry conference and ate one of their sandwiches is like enough to sort of contaminate you as a researcher, mm -hmm. on the one hand, mm -hmm. and on the other hand. There are many people who believe that uh, uh, the very idea of even looking askance at, mm -hmm. say, something like Aqua Bounty, to put it in your wheelhouse yep. or, or, or hold, um, <laughs> uh, uh, is uh, you know you shouldn't label anything because the labeling, the active information is radioactive because of the. Mm -mm. So let's reframe that. So okay, so genetically modified foods. So who do I believe? How do I evaluate Nobody. that as a journalist now, not as a person, mm -hmm. you know, but as a as a journalist? Now I want to write about this, but I can see, wow, it's already yeah. a war going on. Yeah, I think it's really it's become impossible to talk about GMOs in any kind of nuanced way, yeah. um, and I blame the industry for this. They brought this on themselves. Um, but that's through uh, secrecy or for secrecy for secrecy and for a lot of other very 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 bad behavior um, and for focusing on safety as the only issue when in fact there are many many other issues related to GMOs that um, I think people are concerned about um, monoculture who who makes decisions about the food supply mm -hmm. That's a good labeling, food systems question. labeling and information mm -hmm. and that kind of thing it's a particularly sensitive issue for me because there's a movie called food evolution floating around um, I talk to reporters almost every day of my working life usually more than one um, I mean I talked to uh, talking to journalists is a big part of what I do and I was interviewed for this film, um, and I'm quoted in, as saying in the film that GMOs are safe, which is something that I believe, safe to eat. Um, but when I saw the film, I asked to have my clip removed, and the director refused. And this is the first time in however many years, certainly 30 years of talking to reporters constantly, when I have been quoted out of context in a public way. I was not very happy about it. I'm not very happy about that film um, because it focuses on food safety and, re and rejects all of the other arguments as being anti-scientific, anti-vaccine, and climate denial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a piece of propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, and every time I hear about it, I get Mm -hmm. Distress, and also I thought it was. Uh, I, I have a 10-second clip. I didn't think my 10 seconds would make any difference to that film. He refused. He said I had signed a release, mm -hmm. and I could take him to court, hey. which I was not about to do. So I don't think you can do it in a way that's nuanced. Um, you can try to write a balanced 
account of it, and I think there are people who do, certainly the New York Times in writing about it, the people who are writing about GMOs right, in try. Fairness, in fairness to the people who are doing that the New York Times, each one of their stories takes about a year, um, and they're very long, so they can, no, no, I mean, yeah. I'm talking in, about people right. who served this program as mm -hmm. you know scholars and things i'm not being right. rude and they get they killed. have an opportunity to really dig deep yes and um, they get excoriated afterwards by I one side or the other I or I both so i mean i think from you your know, standpoint and then we have a question so you know it is tricky you know as a journalist which i see myself fundamentally mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. as a writer reporter to take uncomfortable positions in relations to these positions, that these uh, issues, that a lot of your friends and colleagues have already taken very public positions mm -hmm. against. So, like in the case of GMOs, you know, um, or in my particular, as you say, wheelhouse, um, aqua bounty, the genetically modified salmon, mm -hmm. you know, there's just the whole wing of the world of fish that is just constitutionally and institutionally opposed to the idea of a genetically modified fish, and. You know, I've been in, I've been to congressional testimony. I've given testimony. I've talked to them. Um, I think the the nice thing about journalism today is that it offers a lot of new formats that hmm. didn't exist before. So I remember one of the thing I'm sort of proud of after having taken various positions in relation to the Aqua Bounty project is that at a certain point I called up um, this guy Elliot Entis. I said, "What is, know. you know, why don't we do a, a debate in?" Yale Environment 360, and we'll just do it mm -hmm. as a debate, and and we did it. And you know, frankly, he actually moved my needle a little bit more mm -hmm. in the direction of thinking that maybe Aqua Bounty wasn't entirely, you know, malfeasant or whatever. You know, that they had some salient points. Um, Your position being that it is, uh, you know, my uh, feeling nutri was nutritional. Uh, I never, I never, something. never felt, mm -hmm. I never felt that the that the GMO salmon was a health risk that never came up for me okay. and i never challenged right. it on those okay. fronts no, um, for me it was always the question of there were you know again going back to zooming out a bit mm -hmm. looking at the fact that you know the united states is a net exporter of wild salmon mm -hmm. you know we're sending our wild salmon abroad and mm -hmm. meanwhile within this country there's this attempt to create a gmo salmon as if we have some sort of salmon deficit so to me, what's much more important than whether or not the GMO salmon is safe, et cetera, et cetera, is these wild salmon systems that we have in Alaska, which are presently being threatened by the largest copper and gold mine in North America, mm -hmm. like in the Pebble Mine situation, that any argument that makes salmon easier to grow uh, undercuts the position of wild salmon and wild salmon systems in the world. And that's my larger mm. point. It gets to your question. Mm. Is it going to kill somebody? Is something going to get cancer from the GMO salmon? I, no, I don't think so. I think they probably, and, and frankly, eating a GMO salmon versus a piece of feedlot beef probably is a better environmental choice in terms of overall carbon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But mm. to take that position publicly within the world of fish and seafood mm -hmm. that has staked out these very clear ideas puts you in jeopardy. Because mm -hmm. all the people in Alaska will say, oh, how could you say anything good mm -hmm. about the genetically modified salmon? But my, my job isn't to say what the Alaskan Salmon Federation wants to say, me to say. My job is to weigh options mm -hmm. and present them to the public. So we have a question. Thank you. Um, so I actually have the same, essentially the same question of who do we trust? Mm -hmm. um, but. Who do we trust when we're reporting on food systems more broadly? Say, reporting on agriculture, where there mm -hmm. are still corporations and different ideologies, and mm -hmm. uh, especially urban-rural divide. How do we report on those issues and and figure out who to trust while doing that reporting? You talk to a lot of people and do a lot of reading, um, and you know, I mean, people will lie to you, but. Y y aren't you trained to try to figure out whether what they're saying makes sense? Um, you report broadly. You try to find people on both sides and see who's making the most sense. Where, where is common sense in this? Where is what everything that you know about the issue? Um, I think it's work to figure that out. And certainly early in my career, I didn't start out with traditional training in nutrition. 
I had to learn it on my own, and I did phenomenal amounts of reading in order to try to make sense of whether fat had anything to do with heart disease or whether a low-carbohydrate diet made sense. I mean, these were all things that I researched extensively early in my career mm -hmm. when I was teaching it. You know, I was doing a lot of teaching, so I would prepare lectures. That's a really great way to do it. Um, and, you know, I, and then at some point I had enough of a framework for thinking about these things so it didn't take quite as much work. And, you know, I think that at this point, if I have a skill, it's looking at a scientific paper very quickly and making sense of it and figuring out what's wrong with it. And I can do that pretty quickly now. Yeah. But the, that's years of practice. Yeah. One of the things I think is tricky about this area, I mean, you know, science writers, we, you know, we go cover the beginning of the universe. I mean, that's a nice, clean, you know, <laughs> uh, thing. There, there's no baggage there. You and know. there were no witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, the next mission to Pluto or yeah. uh, thing. And, and nutrition, I mean, food, I mean, it's, it's got, as our questioner was kind of inferring, uh, or implying rather, um, uh, ideological systems built into it, you know, capitalism, mm, land use, uh, uh, all kinds of philosophical climate stuff. Climate change. Climate change. That, you immigration. know. Immigration. You know, immigration, labor force issues uh, uh, that don't, you know, accrete around a lot of science coverage stuff that people who fancy themselves uh, science writers. Yeah. It's, it's more baggage. Well, question here, I'm sorry. And then, then yeah, okay. please. My question is somewhat similar to the last, quen last one, but um, I'm interested in uh, the responsibility of the consumer um, in their own food, uh, understanding of our food systems. Um, like 100 years ago, we were much more, we, we were living much closer to where our food was grown. And so I'm wondering if some of this emotion or uncertainty or perhaps curiosity around all of the topics we've been discussing um, comes from this disconnect from where our food is coming from. Hmm. Paul? I mean, I think uh, the whole I'll question of consumer choice and whether or not it influences our food system, um, I think might have been a little bit oversold. Um, I think, just coming at it again from my mm -hmm. fishy perspective, mm -hmm. um, there was a very famous campaign um, in the 80s called Give Swordfish a Break. That mm -hmm. some older people in the audience might remember, but it was basically it was one of the first sort of species-oriented things where it was like you were supposed to, if you were a restaurant owner, take swordfish off the menu. If you were a consumer, you were not to order swordfish. And somehow it trickled down to the consumer that if I don't eat that swordfish, that swordfish is going to be swimming and spawning in the Gulf of Mexico. Like I have personally saved <laughs> that swordfish. but. Actually, that wasn't the point of the campaign. The point of the campaign was to stop long lining for swordfish in the Gulf of Mexico during spawning season. And that was a policy decision, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you do this in enough restaurants, at some point, somebody from NOAA is going to be in a restaurant, and he's going to walk in, and he's going to see or she, and see no swordfish on the menu, and then realize, oh, there's a big public blowback against mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do. So I think when you're making food, food choices personally, it's important to keep the long game of the policy involved and not to just stop at you know, choosing whole wheat bread over white bread and thinking that you've done enough. It's really not enough. And to some degree, you know, there's a famous, I, I think you probably know the story better than I, but remember when, I remember in the 70s, there was a commercial for pollution. Um, where a Native American is paddling, the first Americans love oh, the land. Famous commercial, and, and he's yeah. paddling through, and then, and all of a sudden he sees all this garbage, and then finally he gets on the, on the highway, and somebody throws some garbage out, and, then he, and it ends with him crying. Yes, yeah. and, and it's all about how you should stop pollution. Well, actually, that ad was sponsored by a huge industry consortium that was about to get a lot of attention for polluting. So it was like turning it away from industry and saying, oh, no, you have to stop the polluting. Stop throwing the garbage out your window. So again, it's not necessarily what you personally are doing. It's, what who, it's who you're influencing, and it's which policies you're enforcing by making the choices and by making the public choices that you're making. 
Marion, you have something you'd like oh, to I was gonna say? Oh, I was going to say, there's please. vote with your fork, and then there's vote with your vote. And <laughs> vote with your fork means every time you make a food choice, you're voting for the kind of food system you want. Voting with your vote means policy. And you, what you want is you want a food system that's healthy for people in the planet without anybody having to think about it. That's right. Um, you don't want to blame individuals for what's, re for what's really corporate behavior. Um, and that's what corporations love to do, is they love to make uh, individuals responsible for it. Co those sh sugar-sweetened beverage companies, for example, love to fund pick up your bottle campaigns. You go out and pick up the bottles, but they don't want anything. Uh, that they will fight and spend fortunes on fighting campaigns for bottle deposit laws mm. that would encourage everybody to bring their bottles back. Um, but I just wanted to say that on fish, when I wrote my book, What to Eat, which was a book about food issues centered in supermarkets, and I went aisle by aisle throughout. And by the way, I loved your fish chapter, and I totally used it for when I was writing for fish, there so thank you. There are five <laughs> fish chapters. Uh, the uh, biggest uh, section in the or book. Five se your fish section. Because it was so hard to understand. Yeah. And, and in my experience going to fish markets yeah. and asking people at fish markets about the fish, they didn't have a clue what they were selling. Not a clue. You don't have any idea what you're buying. They don't have any idea what they're selling. You're in deep trouble. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember fish. going to the Fulton Fish Market and talking to a fishmonger and asking, he was an old school fishmonger up in the market, and he, I, I said, well, why, why can people sort fish out today? So, used to be the wives, they came to us, they talked to us. We, we, they asked what fish was good, and we knew, we told them. Now the wives, they don't come, they go to the supermarket, and the guy in the fish department, he used, was over in Delhi, or he maybe was in bread, and now he's in fish. <laughs> what does he know about fish? <laughs> so there you go. That <laughs> was my experience. Right there. Yeah, um, I, I would just wanted to, it seems like a lot of the questions in the audience were about expertise, and it seems like a lot of the answers were about, like, build up your own expertise on the subject. But I think that is a little bit unrealistic, and it feels like, Marion, you were saying, go to the funding source for the paper, but when journalists are turning to expert opinion, right, the scientists that they are even quoting in their stories have themselves received funding, not just for their studies, but for consultancies to be spokespeople. This is not necessarily disclosed, right? No, you have to ask them. So, so I'm wondering about the role of journalism and maybe even the role of the university. We have someone here from the provost's office who could maybe make this a role at NYU. <laughs> but where you have to make uh, maybe journalists only interview or represent people who have fully disclosed their own personal funding sources on these issues? Well, I think journalists need to ask that question, especially if a source has a pro-industry position. You want to ask the source, um, you know, are you, do you have any consulting or other financial arrangements with this particular, in, with this particular industry? How do, you, how do you handle that? Me personally? Yeah, you're very scrupulous. What do you do? Share with us. Um, you mean my personal policy about taking money? Yeah, no, when you list stuff, tell us. Um, it's, well, first of all, I find disclosure very embarrassing, and I assume that everybody else does too, so it's a sensitive issue. But I, st you know, I write about conflicts of interest, so I thought I'd better clean up my own. Mm -hmm. And I want to have relationships with food companies. I need to know what they're doing. I need to have access to them. I need to be able to ask them questions. Um, and I want to go to their meetings. But I'm an academic. I get an academic salary. Um, I, so I, my policy is I take travel money, I take meals, I pick up swag. I love swag. <laughs> um, all of which have been shown to influence. All of them have. Right. And the one thing that I don't do is I don't personally take money for honoraria, even though almost all of my talks have honoraria, not this one, have honoraria associated with them. Um, and I just don't take honoraria personally from food companies. And I'm emphasizing personally because it's ridiculous not to ask them to pay. So I ask them to either make a donation to 
um, the food studies collection at mm -hmm. the NYU library or to the department. If they can't do that, then I ask them to make the check to me and I just endorse it over. Um, but that's my personal policy. I think it works for me. Ethicists have sort of looked it do over. Do you post this somewhere? I, I have it on my website. If I was going to do what she's saying, I, I'm going to talk to you, but geez, I better find out beforehand. It's on my website under... Just how corrupt you are. It's <laughs> um, yeah, it's on my website so you under... you post it publicly. It's on my website under mm -hmm. about. Because mm -hmm. um, you, you're, you're very scrupulous. You listed a long list of things all the way down to swag, which I think is telling. But, you know, a standard conflict of interest thing doesn't get to that level. Oh, actually, I mean, it does. The, really? uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, there are some journals that require elaborate um, conflict of interest statements, and I did a review for the, 19, um, for the 2015 dietary guidelines, and what I had to fill out for that was absolutely extraordinary. Um, you know, every uh, lecture that I had given f for which I got an honorarium, it's a very long list, um, and, you know, it's, so I try not to have financial ties to food companies, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, and I, it makes me think about it. I, I think twice. Can, can I just speak to it really quickly? Yes, please. please. Um, just one other thing about um, how do you know, how do you know who to trust and expertise? One thing I think, especially I noticed not a lot of younger journalists asking, circling around this question, I have found that in teaching writing courses, journalism courses, that there is a tendency to try and do everything from your computer and to try and, you know, use the internet as a, you know, mm -hmm. as a primary source. I would encourage you to get off your butt and get away from your computer and talk to people. And if you can, get to them physically in their space. Because we are intuitive creatures, and you, you must have experienced this as a mm, reporter. Sure. You can hear all these great things about somebody. When you sit down in their office, if there's something fishy going on, you c as, it were. as it were, I can't, I can't avoid these puns, but, <laughs> no, um, but you, you sense it. And you sense it, and you sense it in their demeanor. You know when they're off. And that's, you know, talk about a skill that needs to be honed a little bit over time, but you don't hone it from, the, from behind a computer. You hone it in the field. Yeah, it is with great reluctance that I bring this conversation to a close. Hey, um, but I think you have, but the two of you have been like really kind of proof of the point that you're making here at the end. It is through our physical presence, our ability to kind of be with you for a little bit, hear you talk, hear you hold forth, and share what two lifetimes in this field have discovered and determined I thank you so very much for that. Thank you. Because I couldn't get that through a computer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank very, you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Except